Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to part 5 of our Close Combat 2 series. Close Combat 2 is a real-time tactics or real-time strategy game which allows you to replay Operation Market Garden. Uh, the game is called Close Combat 2, A Bridge Too Far, and it is also one of the all-time classic games from the 1990s. Uh, in this game, you have, I think, one of the best campaigns in any war game ever, whereas the Allies, you attempt to execute Operation Market Garden by taking a series of bridges over the rivers in Holland and eventually the Rhine, which will allow the Allies to drive into Germany, and as the Germans, you attempt to stop them. There's this sort of operational map uh, which gets played on or, or at least where you kind of see things unfold and then there's the tactical map which you see in front of you here today uh, where you actually execute your orders and commands in squad based combat uh, and try and take the various objectives as you take or fail to take uh, an individual town or an individual map in the tactical battle the results there are then reflected on the uh, on the operational map and you can either have more success or less success than historically occurred. You can capture bridges intact that were not taken intact. You can lose bridges that were actually taken intact. And, and this all essentially means that you can recreate an alternate history. The Allies may have more success at Market Garden if you're good as the Allies than they did historically. And maybe you can get them over the Rhine. Uh, if you're the Germans, maybe you can stop the Allies cold and prevent them from getting as far as they did. Maybe you can completely wipe out the British Airborne that was uh, dropped on the final bridge objective up near Arnhem. You know, all these kinds of outcomes are at your display. This game was made by, I think, Microsoft, actually, Atomic Games and Microsoft, back in the 1990s, and it was one of the best games, one of the best tactical games of all time. Uh, it predates Combat Mission, and there was a long series of games that kind of came out with it. There was Close Combat 1, but Close Combat 2 really was when the series came to its own and became something special, uh, and, and that's what we're playing here in front of you today. They did follow that up with a Close Combat 3, which looked at the Eastern Front from the beginning of the war to the conclusion. Uh, in a, I, I haven't played it, but I do own the game. They had a Close Combat 4, which I believe... Was that Normandy? And then 5 was Battle of the Bulge. But essentially there were five close combat games in the original series. Uh, the series was then, uh, after many years, sold to Matrix and Slytherin games who sort of repackaged, remastered, sort of uh, tweaked these games into a, a line of their own close combat games. But the reason I'm playing Close Combat 2 is, one, because it seems like I'm in the process of doing a lot of old games, but two, because uh, it is it has been released along with all the other originals uh, on goodoldgames.com, which is a website where developers release games that are remastered to work on modern operating systems. So Matrix and Slytherin actually worked with Good Old Games to re-release the original Close Combat games, which they did not have a hand in making, but they did own the licenses to, uh, or did own the rights to, and they've re-released it on Steam, so you can get all the classic Close Combat games and play them on a modern operating system. I've had no issues running Close Combat 2. I've had some with 3, but I haven't really looked into like That was when it first came out. I just kind of tried to start it up, and I had a, a couple of issues, and never really did anything, because, frankly, Close Combat 2, I've still got an original disc for. This is one of my favorite games of all time, kind of... Uh, I didn't play it anywhere near as much as I played Sid Meier's Gettysburg, but it was one of those games that I got years after it had come out. I found it in a bargain bin in, uh, in like a half-price books and uh, played it quite a bit for, you know, didn't really take the time to understand it, but I just remember it was really cool, and I think it kind of fits the Sid Meier's mold where it feels like there was love and care and attention put into it, and the production values are uh, at levels that we typically don't see in war games these days. You know, they had full motion video, they had campaign introductions, uh, they had just a layer that I feel like most war games nowadays seem to strip out, and uh, I really did appreciate that with this game. Uh, with that being said, uh, with this is part five, so I have played four half an hour parts of this series already. Uh, we're uh, currently uh, in an engagement uh, in and around, 
the Eindhoven area. Actually, the map is called the Schindendel Dunes. I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, mispronouncing that. Uh, but essentially, this is sort of a sand dune formation. We're not really fighting in the sand dunes. Uh, I'm assuming this is part of the town of Schindel. Uh, but you can see here to the left side of the map and the bottom of the screen, there are various sand dunes which are reflected on the map. Now, uh, we're trying to defeat the Germans who are defending this town area, but if we get to the sand dunes, uh, then we'll have to deal with that as well. Now, this was uh, in the Eindhoven sector, so this is with the 101st Airborne, the first area uh, that 30 Corps will be able to advance to and attempt to liberate uh, in the effort to drive up uh, the highway, getting all the way to Arnhem if we're successful. Uh, but the Sand Dunes is one of the maps in the Eindhoven sector uh, up near the town of Schindel. It's also near this road uh, that 30 Corps will have to travel up. So my assumption is, and the, the, the briefing for this battle says that the Germans have substantial forces in and around the dunes. My assumption is these dunes are kind of uh, a, a strategic or, or position where they overlook the highway that the Allies need to advance north to get to these other towns. Because remember... As part of Market Garden, the Allies are advancing an entire army corps up a single highway. So these dunes overlook the highway, and if the Germans positioned anti-tank guns, for example, uh, in these dunes, in these natural defensive positions overlooking the highway, then they would much more easily be able to disrupt the advance of any forces moving up the highway. And in the case of Market Garden, these dunes could potentially delay in advance substantially. So we've got our airborne troops right now because 30 Corps isn't here yet. We've got our airborne troops of the 101st Airborne attempting to seize this town area. And if we do take the town or the dunes, or essentially if we take this map, then uh, the Germans will be less of a threat to us uh, and we'll be able to advance more rapidly. So as a reminder, the way these campaigns work... You've got all these different little mini maps that are uh, fit into this overall operational look. And, uh, you know, if you take one of these maps, then it's your, under your control. If the Germans counterattack, they can retake this map from you. And what, what maps or what areas you hold has an influence on how the campaign unfolds. So Third Corps is going to try and drive north. And as they get to these different sectors in, in this sort of operational layer then if, you're, if you hold maps that you otherwise didn't historically hold, or if you don't hold maps that you did historically hold, you can alter history, right? You could get a more rapid advance for 30 core. You could have a slower advance for 30 core. And at some point, I believe you gotta, you have to take the map anyway. So if 30 core gets here and we haven't taken this, this map yet, then we'll have to try and take the map. We'll have 30 core uh, on our side, so you'll get, like, armor units and things like that as the battles go on. Um... But essentially, that's the situation right here. So we ran into heavy German resistance. We lost pretty heavy casualties on the outskirts of this town. We're advancing into the town. We've dropped some smoke on this building. We've got some infantry sort of charging in, hopefully, uh, to be able to overwhelm. Oh, there we go. We won the battle. So you can see the battle ended because the Germans were routed from the map. The Allies gained control of the area, and the Germans are expected to launch a counterattack later. German forces took excessive losses. Allied progress is 40 out of 40, so essentially we are meeting the expected progress by the end of the day. You can see there that uh, the Allies lost 6 KIA, the Germans lost 5, uh, but the Germans had some additional wounded. In any event, we were able to take uh, the objective uh, and secure that roadway so that as the uh, 30 Corps advances uh, north from uh, the border toward uh, Eindhoven uh, and passed into the sort of Son area. Hopefully we are able to um, do better uh, than the Allies did historically there. You can see they're down by Schindel there. Operational points 32. That little yellow line on the map I believe represents the fact that the Germans, or sorry, that 30 Corps has reached Schindel. Uh, and that, that yellow map line on the map from Volkenvard toward Son, I think represents the advance of 30 Corps. So I think actually parts of the 101st Airborne have already been liberated. Uh, those operational points are very high because essentially we now have the whole of 30 Corps there as well, which means you can, you can draw additional forces in battles where 30 Corps is located. The next battle, however, looks to be taking place in Vigeltown, uh, which is, I think, north of uh, the Son area. Uh, and north of where we have 30 Corps apparently having gotten, because you can see there again only one operational point in Vigil itself.
So uh, with that being said, I think we'll go ahead and we'll move forward to the uh, uh, operational layer where we can start picking out our units, our support units, and see what force we want to bring to battle here in the fight for Vigil here. So this is the uh, screen where you kind of pick your, your soldiers so that you get a you get the operational map that tells you where you're going to fight, and then you follow that up with getting the sort of battlefield map, or sorry, the the uh, unit map where you pick which units go into battle. You get certain units that are just given to you, but then if you want to add like support units, artillery, mortars, machine guns, you have to spend operations points to get those. Once you're linked up with 30 core, you basically have unlimited operation points, but up until that point, you have a very finite limit, which is supposed to represent the fact that your airborne troops are cut off from easy supply, and so you get a certain amount every day which represents like airborne supply uh, but then you also um, you know get and and if you spend those early in the day because this this campaign takes place over several days then you may not have enough points for another battle which could occur in the same sector uh, then and uh, not be able to get a sufficient force to win that battle but but anyway so as we jump into this battle, and uh, for those of you who may be looking for a little more history in this video, it probably isn't going to come. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more in future videos. Um, you know, there's there's some other YouTubers out there who've done a much better job than anything I can do from a historical discussion perspective. People like Tick uh, out there are, are, are great sources if that's really what you're looking at. Uh, additionally, I do, you know, we are playing a game, so we do want to talk about the history uh, sometimes, but we also want to go ahead and make sure that we're spending some time talking about the gameplay as well. So, uh, we're currently fighting the Battle of Vigal Town, uh, and uh, we've got all of our troops here in these sort of three buildings. We've got some mortars laid out, and I think what I'm really going to do is I'm just going to kind of do a broad advance across the front, uh, principally into these buildings here. So, one of the things that I've always learned, uh, or at least that I've learned in my return to close combat, is the importance of using cover. And especially in this game, it feels like if anybody's in the open, they're going to die. Uh, so in this particular map, there's a nice stretch of buildings that go one after another after another uh, that I can kind of use to, to leapfrog. Uh, position to position and hopefully get across the map without too much opposition here. So you can see here we've got these buildings all with the number three, which I believe represents the fact that they're three stories tall. That's my understanding anyway. Uh, and uh, we're going to just kind of advance building to building across this uh, line of what I assume are three-story apartment buildings. Uh, meanwhile, in the north here, we've got this warehouse, which is... A little bit exposed uh, the entranceway you can see our troops kind of have a little bit of a field and like a stone wall uh, between them and the uh, and the building but we're gonna go ahead and fast move them into that uh, meanwhile we have discovered an enemy panzer Shrek so basically an enemy bazooka team is in this three-story building here off to the left we're gonna go ahead and drop some fire down on it with our mortars uh, most of the sort of experts that I know or maybe not experts but most of the Big close combat fans I know who played a lot more of it than I did uh, growing up always mention how, at least in the original close combat games, mortars were like the super weapon. They were like the hey, weapon you could use to just own the battlefield. So that has come a little bit into my uh, military or into my team construction here where I, I understand, listen, mortars are important. So that's why we've got two mortar teams on this battlefield to lay down fire, both uh, HE and uh, and eventually probably smoke here. Meanwhile, the troops got to that uh, two-story building, which kind of looks like a warehouse here in the north. They're going to go ahead and sort of leapfrog building to building in the north, while our troops in the south kind of hold place. Uh, we did discover one enemy infantry unit here on this southern building, uh, so we'll have to go ahead and neutralize that as well. We're shifting some of our artillery fire over that way. A Panzer Shrek is a annoying, but it's not going to wipe out squads of infantry, most likely. Uh, it will destroy, you know, armored vehicles, but it's probably not going to destroy, uh, you know, our, our infantry units. So we'll go ahead and focus our artillery on them, hopefully get these infantrymen here in the south, these uh, Sharvavushka, I can't even, I, I really shouldn't even try and pronounce those things. Uh, so we'll go ahead and try and get the mortars to be firing on these guys, uh, so that we can advance on the Doctor's office here in the center. It's one of the objectives on the map. Uh, meanwhile, the Panzer Shrek uh, still seems to be there. I don't know if he's pinned down or whatnot, but uh, uh, whatever. Um, we're going to go ahead, because we know there are troops on our flank, on our southern flank, these infantry troops here in this three-story building are going to sneak to the doctor's office, which means they're basically going to crawl 
uh, down there. And while I've given that order, I'm also going to give the uh, mortar units an order to drop some smoke uh, between our infantry, which is now moving a little bit exposed with its flank in the air there. Uh, they're going to drop some smoke rounds here, hopefully in front of these uh, German troops in the south uh, to cover the advance. Or That's the idea. My mortars... Okay, there we go. We finally got some smoke that's starting to pop there. Uh, it takes a little bit for the smoke once the rounds do land to start uh, sort of obscuring uh, line of sight. But eventually it starts to work. So you can see the smoke is starting up there. It's a little bit further south than I would like. It certainly would allow for a uh, frontal assault. And actually, maybe that's what we'll do here. We'll see about charging one of our infantry units here, one of our ad hoc rifled units uh, into the into this building. Actually, we'll send two infantry units into this building. They're going to be advancing under cover, so we've got all that smoke between them and the Germans, which hopefully uh, will shield them from fire and get them in there. It looks like the Germans did just fire at least one rifle shot at those guys uh, and uh, kind of pinned them down a bit. Um, I had hoped they could use the smoke. They definitely aren't getting massacred like they would otherwise. Uh, but I was really hoping they'd just charge in there and, and kind of hand-to-hand -hand the Germans to, to uh, a bloody, bloody defeat, defeat. Just suffered a casualty. The leader of this unit here was just killed dead. Uh, and uh, the new leader, or is it Leaker? Leaker? Uh, is now incapacitated and panicking. Uh, and, uh, great. So someone threw a grenade, though. It sounded like they may have hit the Germans in that building. And uh, we're closing in there, so I'm going to assume, as I kind of zoom up on the map a little bit, that we're going to win that fight. A um, whole bunch of smoke, uh, but it didn't really seem to do as good of a job as I would have liked. We definitely lost some casualties here. Uh, trying to fast move our troops in there. It looks like we got them. Uh, so the German, I, maybe that was a sniper, actually. Uh, looks like the, whatever the Germans were in that building are dead. Uh, and now we can kind of advance on the Panzerschreck building here at the end of this roadway and uh, and get over there. We took the doctor's office, so we have a foothold on this map uh, to the west of our spawn point. And uh, our artillery continues to fire and support. Uh, I do see on the map here, it looks like there's a red dot where the Panzerschreck is, but I don't see any other German units at the moment. So, uh, because of that, we're just going to drop our mortars in on, on the Panzer truck, I guess. Wait a minute. Did I see something up here? No? Alright, well, I guess we'll drop our, our fire down on the Panzer truck there. And we'll uh, continue moving inexorably uh, from right to left across this map. Um, Close Combat 2. Also, one of the other things I really enjoy about this game is the maps. Uh, you can see, for whatever reason, the Panzer Shrek has decided to leave his cover, by the way, and uh, switch to a building even closer to our, our troops. I, I don't know how he intends to survive. Now he's crawling out in the open towards us. What the hell? This guy's nuts. Um, yeah, I don't know what he's doing, but he's probably going to die. In any event, I, one of the other things I think this game does an interesting job uh, is uh, being able to effectively uh, sort of diagram maps or design maps that are varied and interesting. I don't know how the other games in the series play out, because I really haven't played much of them. I've played a little bit of Gateway to Con, but I uh, haven't played much else. And, uh, you know, this one's like a long and narrow map, so there's not a lot of room north-south to flank. The last map was a wide, sort of short map, or actually that was just in general a bigger map. But it's interesting how the map design kind of uh, sort of funnels your troops into various different directions or kind of guides the gameplay here. Looks like we got the Panzer Shrek, so now we're just going to try and advance our troops. There do still seem to be some German soldiers that are kind of pinned down in one of these two buildings. I'm not sure which. It looks like his uh, crew member. I don't know why they're advancing toward me. I, I rarely see enemy troops commit suicide, but that certainly seems to be what they were doing. Uh, meanwhile, you can see here we've got a whole bunch of uh, mortar rounds in and around this building. Probably should. Uh, well, someone's still shooting at someone. I'm still hearing gunfire, but at least a substantial reduction in the amount of small arms fire going on seems to indicate that uh, that uh, we're, we're winning the fight, perhaps, and we'll start advancing troops on the northern edge. Uh, the troops in near the doctor office are kind of at the end of where they can move without exposing themselves. Uh, the troops in the south could potentially move one more building, uh, but there's definitely quite a bit of fire going on 
Maybe we're... Oh, we appear to be shooting at troops across the river. So there is a... There are two bridges on this map, but they're not actually, like... The, the Germans don't blow them. There's no timer on them. But there do appear to be Germans on the other side of the bridge. As I said, this is more of a gameplay discussion. I will talk more about the history in follow-on videos. But I also do want to talk a little bit more about gameplay. I kind of gave some high-level information about the game earlier in this video. Um, but... Uh, I think it's interesting. You know, I've been I've been playing a lot of Sid Meier's Gettysburg lately, and, and, and it kind of reminded me. Well, I played some close combat not that long ago, and and there are some tremendous old games. And I'm not becoming an old game channel, but I do feel like right now, with the games that are out there, I'm really having trouble getting into anything. Um, the last game that I really got into. Uh, and, and really loved playing a bunch of it was Ultimate General Civil War. I played the hell out of that for like a year and a half. And I don't know if I'm burned out on it or if I've just played it too much or whatnot. Uh, but I, I, can, I think I'm kind of done with that for now. Um, I played a bunch of Cold Waters last year as well. There hasn't been that release this year that's grabbed me to this point. You know, we're into July. There hasn't been that game that I've said, I've got to play more of that. I played some Field, uh, or I played some Field of Glory. I played some March to Glory. Uh, I played some of the Cold Waters uh, China expansion, which I do have actually some stuff recorded, which will be which will be put up for that lately. Uh, but I, but as far as new games that are coming out that I really want to talk about, really want to play, really want to do a lot of content on, there's not. Um, you know, maybe uh, when the new Close Combat game comes out, so we're we're looking at Close Combat 2 here. But uh, Matrix and Slytherin are, are working on uh, a Close Combat. I believe it's called the Bloody First which will look at the first U.S. Infantry Division during World War II and will be the first 3D close combat game ever. Um, this game, actually, you can see here there are 2D sprites on the screen in front of you, uh, but this game will be a 3D game uh, that's coming out later this year. Uh, Panzer Corps II is a game that I will be covering on this channel later this year. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of other games, Burden of Command, which I'm really interested in, Rule the Waves 2, which I'm really interested in, and then this Ultimate Admirals game from Game Labs. There are a bunch of games I'm really looking forward to that, I, that I'm going to spend a lot of time on later this year, but right now, I'm in a bit of a rut. There, there's not a ton out there that I want to play or that I want to talk about. And getting Sid Meier's Gettysburg running made me realize there are some really tremendous old games that I'd like to spend some time revisiting. So I think where we're going to go with this series is, is sort of twofold. First off, you're going to see more Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Um, at least five or six more episodes. Second off, uh, I'm going to return to Close Combat 2. This was recorded months ago. I, I fell behind. And I do want to talk about the history, but I'm not going to go into minutia. If you want a super detailed look at Market Garden, look at some of Tick's stuff. Again, I'll link it in the description. Um, but I think what I'm going to do for, I don't know, the next couple of weeks or so, Unless I find that game that I really want to spend some time on that's newer, I think we're going to look at some more Sid Meier's Gettysburg. We're going to look at some Close Combat 2. We're going to do some live streams. And we're also going to maybe look at some Sid Meier's Antietam, uh, some Scourge of War Gettysburg, some of these games that have been out for a little bit a little bit longer. Sid Meier's uh, being, uh, or sorry, uh, Scourge of War being much newer than any of the other games mentioned. And I'd like to talk Let's through them. So, like, I want to do Close Combat 2. I want to do the history, but I also want to talk about the gameplay. Uh, I gave a little bit of a hint of sort of the way the game's structured, but I think I'm going to do a video about the actual like, detail, deep dive, kind of like what we're talking about with Bombing the Right, where I say, like, this is how you plan a mission. Um, so talk about what you're seeing in the screen in front of you, why I'm doing the things I'm doing. For example, like right now. There's a German reserve unit of infantry in this bridge on the other side of the West Bridge. They have a great field of fire. If we try and cross the bridge, they will likely slaughter our troops because they will have no cover trying to cross that bridge. And the Germans have a great line of sight. Additionally, there may be other German units in and around this uh, area that uh, could be a threat. There could be machine guns. Uh, actually, you can see there's two reserve squads, both overlooking this bridge as we zoom out. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm actually dropping mortar rounds uh, in and around the bridge uh, that have smoke. Uh, and the intent is to use the smoke to cover uh, an advance of ours. So you can see here we're moving these infantry forward. There's a whole bunch of smoke in front of this bridge. Uh, the problem is uh, I haven't really covered the bridge over to the north. Uh, I haven't adequately covered my, my soldiers that are moving across the bridge, I don't think, uh, in, in smoke cover. 
So I've got all these different units that are kind of laying smoke. They're they're trying to provide cover as we have this one infantry squad charge in across uh, the way and trying to overwhelm these Germans in close combat. So we have close combat, a bridge too far, while well, those soldiers are now fighting in close combat. So we have, uh, you know, moved our troops into that building uh, under the, the cover of smoke, uh, and uh, now we're shifting our fire to this other building, which also has German reserve troops in it. So, charged into the building, took, a, took some casualties, uh, and the Germans uh, still have more troops that we need to deal with. So now we need to kind of replicate our tactics, right? Uh, additionally, uh, we don't have a ton of troops across the river yet, so we probably need to get more troops across this river. You can see the, the West Bridge changed into our hands as well. So, kind of talking about that kind of stuff. So, I think what I'll do here is we'll have uh, the next video. We'll talk a little bit about gameplay, walk through fighting a scenario, and you can see there's, there's also a whole bunch of German troops here on the bank of the river that are massacring that one squad of mine that I put over. Uh, but essentially, talking through um, sort of gameplay, talking through tactics, and then I will jump back into the history, uh, a little bit more detailed chron chron chronology. Uh, of what actually occurred in Operation Market Garden, but it's still it's going to be somewhat superficial, somewhat high level, kind of a twenty thousand airplane uh, foot view look at this because I'm not an expert, um, and it's not going to be a high production value documentary. So kind of that talking about the history while playing the game, uh, but also providing some gameplay insights. I'm going to return to bombing the Reich as well in a day or two. Um, I think we'll probably have an Ultimate General video, or sorry, a Sid Meier's video tomorrow, and then the day after we'll return to bombing the Reich, uh, which will be looking at uh, planning a night bombing raid. So in our last video, I showed you how to plan a day bombing raid, and we hit Germany with B-17s. I want to show you about night bombing and kind of my tactics for wiping out German cities with the British Air Force, because at the start of the bombing the Reich campaign, the Royal Air Force is far more powerful uh, than the Allied Air or the American Air Force, uh, and has the ability to do quite a bit of damage, although in a very different way. You're, you're typically not bombing industry, you're bombing uh, cities. Uh, and I think, you know, it might... It's an interesting discussion topic, perhaps, even for like a podcast, but bombing the right, I think, is the only war game that I've ever played... And this is not a bad thing. I, I don't think I'd recommend the games doing this. But Bombing the Reich might be the only war game that I've ever played where you get points for killing civilians. I mean, the game's not going to claim that's the objective, but you get terror points for bombing area targets. And really, the thing the British are supposed to do is bomb area targets. And it's an accurate representation of World War II, right? The, the whole British bombing campaign was focused around dehousing, as they called it. The thought was, if you remove someone's house from the equation, their morale will drop. If my house gets destroyed, my morale will drop. If enough people's houses get destroyed, the whole social support system will break down, uh, morale will collapse, the industry and the economy will fall through the, through the floor, and Germany will be defeated. But at the end of the day, if you're talking about destroying people's homes, you're also talking about destroying people. You're talking about killing people. And for a game to award points for terror is pretty clearly rewarding points for killing civilians, which I think is an interesting topic. You know, I've seen other war game podcasts or other war gamers on YouTube talk about the moral dilemma of playing war games, uh, and if there is one. Um, and most of the time, the answer is no. You're, you're fighting individual combat. It's, you know, you're not glorifying genocide or anything like that. It's, they're tactical puzzles that people want to uncover and, and things like that. But bombing the Reich might break the mold there. Uh, and in the usual Gary Grigsby way of covering everything to minutia, uh, it might be different in that way. So it could warrant a discussion there. But in any event, I think the next video will be a Sid Meier's Gettysburg video, the video after that, bombing the Reich, and then uh, maybe returning to some Gettysburg before we kind of get back going with close combat. Um, I'll probably, this is the last recording I have for this campaign of mine, close combat 2. So I'll have to go ahead and return uh, and, and play this. It's been a couple of months uh, and continue the campaign, which is frankly going fairly well. So you can see here we took the West Bridge and we've got some troops that are pinned down here under enemy fire. It's not a great tactical situation, but we've at least taken the bridge. So uh, that bridge won't be destroyed. And now it's just a matter of seeing, do we have enough forces here to destroy the remaining Germans? We've used up most of our mortar or rounds. We're out of ammunition for most of those units. So we can't just hit them with mortar rounds until they're all dead. 
They also appear to be at least partially behind a uh, stone wall, which is giving them some cover. And uh, I'm largely out of smoke rounds, too, so I can't exactly lay smoke cover for my soldiers to cross the bridge. Uh, I really need to try and break this unit. You know, I, I thought I was, I was focusing all my effort, really, on the reserve unit to the north and the uh, building with the number three on it on the, the top left corner of the map and totally didn't even notice, probably because I had covered the whole area in smoke, this uh, this German uh, unit uh, here behind the stone wall, which now that I've used all my smoke, I can't do much against. Um, I think what I'm going to do here now is probably <laughs> just have uh, my soldiers try and charge in on these guys and, and again, kind of melee them. So you can see one of the, the soldiers here is in this building. Go ahead and charge in there. Uh, and uh, hopefully kill or capture this individual. In it looks like he's surrendered. And then we'll go ahead and have uh, have uh, the rest of our units sort of charge these Germans behind uh, their rear and, and, and the flank. Now the good thing, uh, and the surrendering soldier is following our troops. The good thing there is that I think we had pinned him down with a lot of fire, so they weren't really paying attention and they got destroyed. There you can see the battle ended because the Germans were rotted from the map, so charging that unit is all we need to do to win. We lost 5 KIA, 1 MIA. The Germans lost 7 KIA, 5 KIA. And another victory for us uh, in terms of Eindhoven. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the next battles look like they're going to be taking place in the Nijmegen sector. I think this is actually going to be our first battle in the Nijmegen sector. But that will be a video for another time. Uh, I appreciate you guys dealing with my rambling, my discussions of the campaign, my discussions of the game, my discussions of what's next on the channel. A bit of a transitory video, but I hope you guys enjoyed it anyway. Until... Until next time, though, uh, guys, why don't you let me know in the discussion if this is something you want to see more of, If you what you think about sort of my plans going forward, um, probably pulling back a little bit away from the, the documentary style and kind of focusing on quite, sort of a mixing history and gameplay is kind of how I always used to do. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, let me know your thoughts below. Uh, with that being said, I'll go ahead and drop out here. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, and uh, I'll be checking out the comments. But until then, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.